Good afternoon, everyone. Shall we get started then? Welcome all of you to our webinar, which is Making Sense of Data, Top Tips to Get You Started. My name's Jane Parkin. I uh, am a member of the Pro Bono OR Committee, and our speaker this afternoon is Ian Seath, who's the Director at In Improvement Skills Consulting. Could I have the next slide, please? So what we're going to do today, we're going to start off with a welcome introduction. Then it will be Ian's presentation on making sense of data. There'll be time at about a quarter to two for questions and answers. So please put any questions you have in the chat box and we will deal with them then. And then at two o'clock, there will be time, if you've got more time and if you're interested, for more informal discussions rather than just us talking to you. And there'll also be time for you to find out more about OR and the pro bono scheme and whether you think it could help you. Thank you. Next one. Right. This is the first seminar. First of all, welcome to everybody, but these seminars are particularly aimed at people who are working in the third sector with the objective of showing them how we can help third sector organizations. So it's certainly lovely to see students, but we're not actually aiming this seminar at you. There will be uh, another series of webinars specially aimed at people interested in volunteering for Pro Bono OR, and you'll get information about those as soon as it's ready. Right, a very quick overview of operational research. It's been around since the Second World War. It's a scientific discipline it uses methods, a lot of data analysis, it uses a lot of computer modeling with the aim of improving insights into your organization and the efficiency and effectiveness of your organization. It's used widely in the public sector. There's a lot of operational research in government it's also used widely in the private sector, where all big organizations, private organizations, use operational research to make them more efficient and effective. For example, I did operational research for many years for logistics and supply chain management, which helped to get the right goods to the right place at the right time. So that's operational research in general. Now, PBOR is pro bono OR. It's a scheme run by the Operational Research Society, which is a professional organization. And it matches experienced volunteers with charities who are facing difficult challenges. And we've been around for more than 10 years now giving um, voluntary, voluntary uh, help to charities. We've got more than a thousand volunteers on our database and we've got more than a hundred satisfied clients from the third sector. Next slide, please, Ian. So I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Ian Seath. We're very lucky to have him. He's an independent consultant. His experience is mainly in business strategy, performance improvement, and change management. He's a member of our pro bono steering group in the Operational Research Society. He's experienced in supporting pro bono projects across a wide range of charities, including animal welfare, social care, and international development. He's worked with third sector clients since 2004. He's a trustee of Dachshund Health UK and a non-executive director of the Kennel Club. 
the UK's largest organization dedicated to dog health and welfare. So over to you now, Ian. Thanks very much, Jane. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I can see one person with a camera on, Ian. Really pleased to see some smiling faces. So if anybody else would like to turn your cameras on, I'd be delighted to see uh, either bookshelves behind you or um, whatever your virtual background of choice is this afternoon. So please do turn so your cameras on. Those are the if... three biggest economies in the world. And if they start... Right. Um, probably ought to point out that we are recording this, aren't we, Jane? So uh, uh, the, the webinar will be available online after the, uh, the session this afternoon. I've uh, been working in the third sector since about 2004. When I set up my first business, I made a commitment to give at least a day a month of pro bono support uh, to third sector organisations. And I've probably given the equivalent of about £100,000 worth of consulting fees to the third sector since I, I made that original commitment. Uh, James mentioned my dog connections, so you won't be surprised to see there's a painting of one of my dogs in the background. And uh, I'll apologise uh, if there's any barking that happens. Uh, we've got six wire-haired dachshunds, so one of the occupational hazards of uh, uh, trying to run webinars and um, have dogs as well at home. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. I think from our uh, registration, we know there's at least a dozen people from third sector organisations. So you are particularly welcome. I hope the presentation will be of interest not only to those folks, but also to some of the OR people and the students that are, are here this afternoon as well. This is very much a, a taster session. It's a cut down version of a half day workshop that I've run for a number of charities. Uh, and again, uh, it's a flavor of some of the tools, techniques and approaches that many of our OR volunteers will be able to help third sector organizations with. Uh, you will gather as we go through my presentation that I'm an avid collector of quotes and quotations. And one of my favorites comes from Dr. Edward Stemming, who was one of the quality gurus that was shipped out to Japan after the Second World War. Uh, the Americans weren't very interested in improving quality and productivity. So Deming went to Japan along with Joseph Duran. And one of his great quotes is, uh, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So um, that's a really uh, relevant, I think, starting point. In terms of why you might want to collect and use data if you're in the third sector, and I guess actually this applies um, to other sector organisations as, as, as well. First of all, describe what's happening currently or, or historically. And you may hear people talking about descriptive statistics, things like uh, averages and dis stand standard deviations. Uh, you might secondly want to be looking at data to try and forecast what might happen in the future. And we may therefore be talking about predictive analytic models. And the third scenario in terms of use of data, make decisions in the face of uncertainty and using models, for example, to evaluate alternative options and possible future scenarios. And I guess over the last year, we've probably been um, graphed to death uh, I suspect 14 months ago, many, many folks uh, probably didn't realise that they should have paid attention when their maths teacher was talking about exponential functions. But um, as a result of the pandemic, no doubt we've seen loads and loads of descriptive di statistics around proportions of uh, cases and locations of deaths and all the rest of it. We've seen lots of historical and trend data and people trying to project what might happen in the future. And we've got the umpteen models that have come out of the modeling groups that uh, uh, Pat Patrick Valance and uh, Chris Whitty typically put up at uh, the Prime Minister's presentations with their forecasts of what's going to happen over the next period or so. So three potential uses of data. And my tip number one, in terms of uh, making sense of data, decide what you're trying to achieve, then decide what you need to measure. It's very easy, I think, for organisations to say, well, we have this data, what should we do with it? The starting point really ought to be, uh, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And then let's focus on what's the data that we need to collect in order to understand whether we're achieving that as an organisation. I'm going to ask Amy to pop up a poll now, just to get some 
background information from those of you from charity organizations this is uh, obviously more relevant than students but amy if you'd like to uh, put the the poll up what do you see as your biggest data challenge if you're in a third sector organization i will just give you a minute or so you can tick more than one of those boxes if you wish to Sorry, Ian. Um, what, on the last option, um, not enough people are interested in using data to to improve our performance. Sorry, if you can't see that. So number number six, not enough people are interested in using the data to improve our performance. A nice comment, Ian, that's just come on the on the chat button. I don't know if you've seen it, that uh, data quality is a big concern. Right. So that's another one to put on our poll for next time then. Yes, yes. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, I'd certainly agree with that around data quality. We've just finished a big uh, breed health survey in, in the breed that I'm involved in, 10,000 responses. So data cleanup as the, the first stage is a massive task associated with that. Okay, so what have we got in first place equal? Uh, we don't know what data we should collect and we don't know how best to analyze our available data. So th thank goodness we've got this session which attempts to give you some tips around both of those um, particular challenges. And I'd really go back to the uh, decide what you're trying to achieve, then decide what you need to measure. And I will be talking about uh, a couple of uh, approaches in terms of analyzing the available data that you've got. Don't know how to present it, uh, don't know how to use it to drive improvements, not enough people, um, and interestingly, that last one, I've had conversations with third sector organisations, some of the cultural challenges about do people actually want to use data? Do they feel comfortable with using data in order to drive improvement um, and the right tools or IT to make best use of the data? OK, thank you for that. We will come back to that at the end of the session and um, Jane will be talking about future possible uh, webinars with you. For those of you in the third sector, one of my other strong recommendations would be to have a look at um, Data Orchard's data maturity framework and their model. And this is a really great tool to help your organisation assess where are you in terms of um, maturity of uh, making use of data. They have a five stage maturity model and they look at seven key themes around the use of data and measurement and performance management. There's a free version that is available on that website that you can do a very quick and dirty self-assessment of your uh, organization. And then there's a more detailed version as well. So if you're struggling to think about what are we good at or what are we not good in terms of uh, performance measurement, strongly recommend Data Orchard's um, maturity model that's up there. One of the well-known tools in the third sector is theory of change, which is a model that many charities put together to try and make connections between the activities they do, so the inputs to their work, the outputs that they produce, or the products that they deliver, the outcomes and the impacts. And another really useful framework from uh, website inspiringimpact.org. They talk about five uses of data that may be relevant in terms of supporting your particular theory of change in your charity. So user data. So who are the people out there in your communities? Uh, who are the beneficiaries potentially of your services? Engagement data. Uh, how service users are accessing and making use of your service, for example, and the extent to which they use it. Feedback. Uh, often that might be at the end of service delivery processes, uh, what people think about the service that you've delivered. Outcomes data, 
which again in um, theory of change terms, this is short term changes uh, uh, that you're actually seeing as a result of the interventions that your charity has um, put in place. So short term changes, benefits or uh, the assets that people have got out of participating in the intervention or making use of your service. And then finally, uh, the ultimate impact, uh, you might hear um, organizations talking about impact data. Uh, what's the long-term difference that's resulted from the service that you've delivered? And if um, any charities are interested, we have worked with third sector organizations, helping them to put together theory of change for their particular interventions and their, their beneficiary groups. So that's potentially one area of support that pro bono OR volunteers could help your charity with putting together a theory of change. So just building on uh, those five uh, sources or uh, areas of data collection, uh, just thinking about if you are in a charitable organization, what are the potential data sources that are available to you? Uh, many charities these days will have CRM systems, customer relationship management systems, uh, Salesforce, Zoho, Razor's Edge are probably three of the main systems that uh, I come across in my uh, uh, work with, with third sector organizations. Many also will be using uh, mailing mail shot systems or newsletter systems such as MailChimp or Vertical Response. Those obviously, those systems give you access to basic user data. In terms of engagement data, uh, many charities, if you're running online events these days, Eventbrite, Ticket Tailor would be great sources of engagement data. How many people are um, participating in your programs or expressing an interest in um, uh, participating in your programs. Your finance systems, again, typically in the third sector, Zero Sage and QuickBooks are probably the tools that, um, or the software that I come across most often. And in terms of uh, using those, clearly data around donations, grants made, etc., cetera, uh, would be uh, relevant from, uh, from, from those systems. Feedback data. Uh, most of us probably be familiar with tools like SurveyMonkey. If you are using SurveyMonkey seriously, you're probably going to have to go for a paid for license. If you can't afford a full license for SurveyMonkey, Google Forms and Microsoft Forms are my two favorite free online survey tools. And I've been running uh, breed health, canine breed health surveys for the last probably 10 or 12 years using Google Forms. So that is actually my weapon of choice if I want to do a survey um, of, uh, 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 as part of, part of the charity that I'm a trustee of. The other way of gathering feedback, if you're making presentations, there's two freely available tools. One's called Mentimeter and the other's Poll Everywhere. And these are tools that enable you to create slides as part of the presentation and you present the slide and people can then vote using their smartphone. So you can set up a, a, a very simple poll, you can gather data and create a word cloud, for example, or you can do ranking and uh, rating. So Mentimeter is free, enables you to set up a two slide presentation. You can set as many two slide presentations as you want and not have to buy a license. Poll Everywhere, the free version, lets you embed the Poll Everywhere tool into PowerPoint and for up to 25 users, that is also free as well. So both of those are really useful tools in, in my experience. Outcomes data, um, again, survey systems, focus groups, interviews, and impact data. Uh, there's a ton, obviously, of published statistics available from ONS and other government sources. And again, many charities may be, or the bigger charities may be commissioning research projects to do specific impact analysis and long-term studies of uh, the effect of their interventions. So just really just building on that range of um, data, uh, data types with some potential sources of data that you might have available to you. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are lots of really simple tools for data collection as well. Uh, top right, I did some work with a very small charity. They were running uh, social events for elderly and isolated people and they had coffee mornings 
in the days when we actually used to be able to meet and do things like that. And I had a flip chart with three smiley faces and just asked people to put a tick behind which of the smiley faces reflected um, what you felt of, of, about the particular session or um, uh, meeting that you'd been to. Dot voting, uh, again, I guess everybody these days is working online and maybe using online whiteboarding tools. So things like dot voting, using whiteboarding tool like Mural or Miro would be a couple that are particularly well known. Uh, some of my clients are using Google Jamboards, which is another freely available Google whiteboarding tool. On the left-hand side, good old tally sheets and check sheets, the five bar gate uh, to uh, collect basic data, notching up the number of inquiries or complaints or whatever it is. And one of my favorites, uh, concentration diagrams. So this is the very famous John Snow Broad Street pump cholera outbreak in central London, uh, where he mapped the outbreaks of cholera. So if you've got, for example, beneficiaries, you might want to be uh, using a concentration diagram pictorially to, to, to look at where do they live, uh, and uh, again, there was a charity that I, I, I came across mapping where their beneficiaries were versus where their service delivery points were, and there was a complete mismatch. So uh, a fairly simple data collection tool to say, are we putting our services in the right place for the right people? So my tip number two for uh, data collection, really, no measurement without recording. So don't dream up something that you want to measure if you don't have a tool to gather the data. No recording without analysis. So if you're not going to try and do something and get some insights from it, don't bother writing it down. And the most important one from a continuous performance improvement perspective, no analysis without action. And I suspect if you apply those three golden rules to a lot of the data that gets collected in many organizations, a vast proportion of it would get collected but not analyzed and even less of it would be used to drive action. I'd probably also want to say that those rules work the other way around. You shouldn't be taking action without analysis of valid data. So that's top tip number two. Let me move on and we'll talk a little bit about descriptive statistics. So uh, understanding what's going on in your organization uh, and we'll talk a little bit about averages. Uh, was it Disraeli said there are lies, damned lies and statistics, something like that? I'm not sure whether it's attributed to Disraeli or, or, or quite who. Um, I picked up this cartoon quite a long time ago, which really said quite a lot to me about um, the fact that averages can be very misleading. Uh, the, the climber at the top of the mountain saying, on average, our rope is two centimetres thick. And the guy at the bottom of the rope saying, that's really good to know. And clearly, uh, if you've got a thick rope, a thin rope and a thick rope, uh, that two centimetre thick average is not a very helpful figure for you. So quite often when we're looking at performance in our charity, we'll be interested maybe in looking at how long does it take us to uh, approve a grant application? For example, how long are people waiting for us to make those decisions about whether we're going to uh, make a grant? And you, know, you might collect some data. Here's some data from 10 grants. And the length of time that it took to process those ranged from 6 to 13 days. And most people would probably want to calculate what's known as the arithmetic mean. So we add them all up and divide by the number of values. And in that case, that gives us a mean of eight. There are two other ways of calculating the average. One is known as the median, and the other is known as the mode. So if somebody says our average time to respond to a grant application is eight days, you need to know whether they're talking about the mean, the median, or the mode. So the me median is the middle value, when you stack the uh, values up in order from smallest to the biggest and the mode is the most frequently occurring value. And depending on what point you're trying to make, uh, one, or, one of those may or may not be particularly helpful to you. In terms of deciding which one you want to use, it's really helpful to think about distributions of data. 
And I suspect all too often we gather data and uh, ask Excel to tell us what the, the mean is, and we don't bother looking at the distribution. And I think um, it's often it's very helpful to actually plot out the frequency distribution. So this is um, two sets of data around grant application processing, 33 grant applications in each set of data. One has a very long tailed distribution over on the left hand side, and the other has a bell shaped normal curve distribution on the right hand side. And if you work out the mean and the median, you get quite different values for those. So I would strongly encourage you, if you're a charity, before you leap to calculating the mean, uh, you really ought to leap to looking at what does the distribution of the data look like as well, because you could get some very different values. And again, in terms of tools and tips, Excel obviously makes that really, really easy to do. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Excel, uh, you've got a data analysis pack add-in, and that will enable you to plot histograms, which is the really quick and easy way to plot those distribution uh, diagrams, although you can obviously do it manually with bar charts in Excel itself. One of the, I guess I'd call it a... Um, a highly underused tool, an analysis tool, is Pareto analysis, sometimes also known as the 80-20 rule. Uh, Vilfredo Pareto, I don't know whether we have any economists in the room, uh, Vilfredo Pareto was, uh, I think, an 18th century economist. He looked at the distribution of population and wealth in Italy and discovered that something like 80% of the wealth was owned by 20% of the population. I suspect if he did his analysis today, it would be called the 97-3 rule rather than the 80-20 rule. But um, it's the rule of identifying what are the sm small number of items that account for a large part of um, the situation. And often uh, you'll see people plotting bar charts where you have categorical data. Uh, the Pareto diagram is a particular type of bar chart. And what we do to produce a Pareto diagram is we stack our bars from highest frequency down to lowest frequency. So this is a chart from a charity that was looking at its sources of funding. And its biggest source of funding was the National Lottery and its second biggest source of funding was trusts and foundations. So you stack those up from biggest down to smallest and what you may also want to do is do a cumulative uh, frequency line on there. And if you draw the line across from 80%, let me see if I can highlight this with the laser pointer. If you draw a line across from 80%, it hits there. So in this case, three categories account for 80% of the funding in this charity. So it's not a perfect 80-20. But what you're aiming to do with the Pareto analysis is identify the small number of factors that give the biggest proportion of the results. So that's the 80-20 rule. Really useful for highlighting where you get most of your funding, what categories of beneficiary are particularly prevalent in um, coming forward and, and looking for support from your organization. And your, your y-axis on this chart it might be frequency or it might be value, um, num number of donors or value of donation. And again, depending on what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to understand, you need to decide whether you want to plot the frequency on the Pareto diagram or the financial value on the Pareto diagram. And I, I suspect that's a, a, a highly underused uh, uh, tool for displaying data. So tip number four from me is separate the vital few from the trivial many. And again, in Excel, uh, in the data analysis pack, Pareto analysis is one of the tools that's available to you in Excel data analysis add-in. Often we're also interested in understanding what's happening over a period of time. And I did some work with uh, a victim support group uh, a few years back and the senior management team 
were trying to get their heads around is caseload increasing, decreasing or not changing. They were concerned about whether they had enough staff uh, to, to provide the support to victims of crime. And this was the weekly caseload chart. Well, they actually weren't plotting weekly caseload at all. All they were doing is logging it in a spreadsheet and saying, here's the table of numbers. So the first thing they did was turn it into a line graph. Um, what can you conclude from this chart and its source data? Can I just ask if, um, if you put into the chat, do you think weekly caseload is increasing, decreasing, or not changing over that 20 week period? Just put a very quick into the chat, what do you think is happening to caseload? Not changing much, staying the same is another way of saying not changing much. Yep. Yeah. Anybody think it's increasing? Somebody says it's going up. Their new cases. Too volatile. Very volatile, no, no stable trend. Yeah, I think the big issue with this data set is the um, fluctuations and the peaks and troughs. So it's very hard to tell what is actually going on. Uh, so the senior management team thought caseload was increasing. So what we did was plotted a four week moving average. And when you plot a four week moving average, you take the first four data points and calculate the average of those. You then drop a data point off and take the next four data points and so on. And that takes some of the fluctuation, the volatility out of it. What do you now conclude? You probably now conclude that the caseload has actually decreased. It was completely the opposite of what the senior management team thought was going on. And it wasn't that they needed more staff. There was something going on that meant that the, uh, the victims of crime weren't actually getting the support and the time from uh, the volunteers that, that they, they should have been. So the other thing we obviously drew in this chart was uh, the mean line for the whole set of data. And some of you may be familiar with statistical process control. We were able to put uh, plus or minus two standard deviations and decide whether the chart, whether the process was in control or not. Again, from a data analysis point of view, the data analysis add in pack in Excel will enable you to calculate moving averages. You can decide how many intervals. My chart here is a four period moving average. Uh, you can put however many intervals in there. So you might do seven days for weekly or uh, four, four weeks for, for monthly data. So you may well need to do some smoothing. And that is tip number five, use averages to move time series data. Tip number six is to think about what the data is not telling you. And this is a really well-known example from the Second World War. I think it's actually an OR example, isn't it? Because it was an OR person that cracked this particular problem. Um, in order to decide where to add extra protection to bombers, the RAF recorded where bullets had penetrated uh, returning aircraft. And the key question that the RAF wanted to answer was, where would you add extra protection? The answer that many people come up with is where the red dots are. What the data is not telling you is what happened to the aircraft that didn't come back. And the aircraft that didn't come back were the ones that had the gunshot wounds through the cockpit or through the, uh, the propellers. So actually, if you're going to reinforce the aircraft, uh, those are the areas that you need to put the reinforcement. So just be really careful thinking about what's the data not telling you, as opposed to what is the data telling you. There was another example of that from, I think it was the First World War, where 
uh, they were really concerned about the number of soldiers dying from headshot wounds. So they designed a new helmet for the soldiers in the trenches. And a month after they launched the new helmets, uh, there was a massive increase in the number of patients going to field hospitals with head wounds. And the immediate reaction was the helmets aren't working, we've made things worse. What's the data not telling you? The data's not telling you. Um, the data's telling you that actually instead of people dying because they were shot through the head, they're now going to hospital and they aren't actually suffering from um, fatal head wounds. So think about what the data is not telling you as well as what is the data telling you. And that takes me to my final slide for this afternoon. It's been a really quick whiz through some principles and uh, approaches in terms of trying to make sense of data. Decide what you want to achieve, then decide what you need to measure. Remember my three golden rules of measurement. Uh, no measurement without recording, no recording without analysis, no analysis without action. Look at the distribution of the data before you leap to calculating averages. Use Pareto analysis to separate the vital few from the trivial many. If you've got very volatile or um, time series data that's showing peaks and troughs, use moving averages to smooth it out. And finally, think about what does the data not tell you? What's missing from your data? Who hasn't responded? Who are the beneficiaries who aren't sending you feedback? And what's that telling you about your data? So brought it in slightly early. It's uh, very much a cut down version of um, uh, a workshop I've run before, half day workshop. If that's of interest to people, I'm sure we could uh, have some conversations about that with your charity. And if there are any of the tools, techniques and analytical approaches that are relevant, please um, have conversations with us about how our volunteers could help your organization make more sense of data. So Jane, I'm going to hand over to you. Well, thanks very much, Ian. I thought that was great. Yeah, uh, you've done a fantastic job at managing to put it into about a half an hour. And we don't seem to have any questions at all. Nobody got any questions they want to ask about this. In that case, no, we just got lots of thanks, Ian. Everybody's thanking you. That's fantastic. Yes. OK. Um, we've got another poll in a minute, but just before that, we've got uh, one more slide just telling you about the pro bono scheme. It's connecting volunteer analysts with good causes. Analysts donate their time and skills to help charities or other organizations with difficult decisions or looking to improve the way they work. Most of our uh, volunteers are experienced with the uh, very wide experience of using analysis. Ah, we've got one question for you, uh, Ian. Are you able to share some of your top tips or do you have a website? You need to unmute, Ian. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was on mute. You'd think after 14 months we'd crack the, turn the microphone on when you want to say something. Uh, yeah. I do have a, a blog, uh, which is improvement-skills.co.uk. Uh, I will put the slides on there. Uh, Amy, um, more than happy for you to share these slides with the participants of the workshop. Send those around by email as well after the workshop this afternoon. So uh, please either look on my website, look on my SlideShare channel, or um, Amy will send those slides to you as well. Thank you, Ian. Right, uh, going back to this, this slide then, just uh, a summary of the sort of support we can, we can um, help with. Oh, we've got another question. Yes. Do you want to, do you want to unmute yourself now? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, that's a bit easier. Go for uh, it. Thank you, Ian, I really appreciate that. Um, just on qualitative data, um, what's your approach or any tips on, on uh, for charities that are working more on the, the qualitative side of things, impact um, for young people, for example, which can't always be easily quantified? Uh, what, what tools are you using or what approaches are you taking at the moment? Um, it's mostly in the form of case studies, but um, yeah. the, they're very anecdotal. The greater issue is um, it, it's long-term change that is very difficult to attribute to any one 
one person or movement. Um, and it's often difficult to, I guess, to, to find a, a data set of sorts. Yeah, um, and actually there was a really interesting pro bono project. I can't remember, Jane might remember who it was. There was one of our committee members that did it, which was case study based. Um, I think we've got a write, of it, a write up of it now some, somewhere or other. We can make sure that that gets sent to you. Well, Certainly, look, I don't remember the specific one, but we can have a hunt, yes. Yeah, um, and actually sometimes those are the most powerful ways of demonstrating the impact that you make by those re really personal stories. Uh, one of the things that we try and do through, through Pro Bono OR is longitudinal surveys. So end of intervention, and then six months and 12 months. So again, you can use, set up um, follow on surveys. Response rates tend to be fairly hopeless, uh, to be fair with some of those, particularly with staff moving on uh, in, in, in charities. Uh, but some, you know, unless you've got loads of money to do more, more um, significant academic research, those are probably the main options that you have available to you if you can track people longitudinally and those case study type approaches. Now, I'm sorry, I don't have a more, um, a more detailed answer for that. That's great, thank you. There's another comment, David. Uh, membership organization, next few months, we will, we, we will have to persuade our members to submit a lot of data so we can show their impact. How to persuade them to submit data. Uh, that is quite interesting. My experience um, in uh, dog health surveys, often breeders and owners are reluctant to admit that they bred dogs with health problems. So trying to persuade people to commit to a survey and, and share data has been a challenge that, that we've faced. So anonymity in the first instance was really, really important. And when you're setting up the survey, making it clear who will see the results, what format the results will take, uh, the fact that it will be completely anonymous and, and non-attributable. The other sorts of approaches um, that I've seen uh, some charities take is um, in incentives to maybe make donations to particular causes or focus on particular projects. So that might be another way of doing it. Uh, David, do you want to just come off um, mute and just say a little bit more about what the data is and what your, what your challenge is? Hi. Yes, I'll come off video as well. <laughs> um, our members are um, uh, non-profit organisations that are restoring and reusing historic buildings. Uh -huh. Uh, and what we need to show for the purpose of showing the sort of impact of our overall membership is you know, how much, how many buildings have been restored, how much space, how many acres of land, but also things like how many jobs have been created and how much turnover has been created, how many um, yeah. spaces have been created for businesses or um, or visitor yeah. attractions so it, it's quite quite a lot to ask them um, the 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 overall reward is that we can make a better case for them publicly um, but you know as individual organizations that's not a huge reward for them no. so it's sort of persuading them that they should be part of this big data collection exercise yeah and that sounds like you have a theory of change that maps out from outputs through short-term outcomes through to impact you know you've talked about some fairly short-term and some fairly long-term there mm -hmm. so you would be you'd typically be looking at what are the performance indicators associated with each of those levels in that theory of change the further out you get um, the more difficult it is going to be isn't it to persuade people to give you data they may not have the data or the the, the answers themselves so I, I guess there's a point about where do you draw the line where are you going to stop asking to collect data where does it stop being meaningful to go and ask those those organizations and um, just be really focused again my experience particularly around dog health surveys people um, people want to ask lots and lots of stuff what's the exam question that you're trying to answer rather than what's all the data that we could answer or could ask for mm -hmm. out there. So being really focused, you know, decide what you're trying to achieve and then decide what you need to measure. 
And if you've got a big theory of change, maybe Pareto applies. You know, eighty percent of the value will be associated with the twenty percent of the things that you could collect data on. Mm, yes, I'm. I'm wondering also to what extent the reward can be the fact that they've got that data on them in one place. And, and that might be useful for, for their own funding applications and so on, but just to, to make, for them to be aware of their impact. Yeah, um, so that's, that is a, that's a really interesting observation, isn't it? That one of the potential, that is one of the potential benefits. So in pitching your data collection, it needs to be really explicit about what's in it for them. Why should they participate in it? And what might they be able to do? And what will you, what data will you be able to share with them in what format so that it's really obvious that there's some value? So they might be able to get some benchmarking comparisons, for example, mm. as a result of whatever analysis. And the more input you get, the better the quality um, and the more validity the analysis will be. So their, their interest is presumably in um, winning grants and support for, for their activities. That's the hook, I think. That you've identified really that will get their participation i suspect okay thank you right where were we yes uh just a, a summary at the the towards the bottom of that slide the sort of things we can help with uh strategic planning uh, obviously very important at the moment um data analysis as uh, ian has covered options appraisal you know, should we do this? What are the options? Decision making, improving your processes and measuring your impact. And if you're interested in getting help on any of those things, then the contact, our pro bono coordinator is Amy Hughes at the OR Society. And if you email her, then she'll be able to help you, point you in the right direction and we can maybe get a project and get some volunteers to help you. And the other thing um, in terms of those areas of support, there are lots of case study examples on the Pro Bono OR website. Yes. So one page summaries of typical assignments that our volunteers have carried out with third sector organizations. So it might be just flip, worth flicking through some of those and seeing whether any of those um, challenges are relevant to your charity as well. Yes, thanks Ian, that's great, yes. Um, right, we have some more webinars in this series. They'll all be the same sort of time. Um, if you're interested in measuring impact, then we've got a, a, a case study from Jamie Douglas, who is an OR analyst in the government at the Department of Work and Pensions, and he's basing his talk on a pro bono project that he's um, done for a charity. Then the next one is um, in June, January, February, March, April, March. yes, June, that's right. Uh, that one's me. And I'm going to be talking about different sorts of models that you can use to improve efficiency and effectiveness of your organization. Then we've got two in July. The first one is on simulation modeling. You may not have come across simulation, but it's a very neat tool to test out different ways of running your operation. And uh, Simulate is a company that has a simulation tool and they actually allow that simulation tool to be used for free for charities. And then the final one is from the chair of our pro bono OR group, Ruth Kaufman, and she's talking about strategic planning in uncertain times, and times are definitely uncertain at the moment. So they are the next ones we're doing, and now I think it's time for the next poll, isn't it, Ian? Yes. Yes, please, Amy. Yes. Uh, this is a, a follow-up to, um, as Ian said, a very quick run-through on data. And so the question for you is, are you interested in another webinar on data? And if so, which particular topics would you find most useful?
I think there was another one we could add to that. I've forgotten what it was. All oh, the data we're getting. It's useless. <laughs> it's useless, yes. Or it's not very clean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so something about uh, how to clean up data. Oh, how about that? Improving performance. Well, how about that? Not a surprise, is it? Yes. Measure and improve performance. So when we plan our next series of webinars, we'll make sure that that one about measuring and improving performance is top. Measuring and improving impact is nearly as high. And presenting results. Thank um, you for that. Tools, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, we will, uh, we will remember those and start planning our next series. So if you want to find out any more, you've got Amy's uh, email address. And if you look on our website, as Ian suggested, there's a lot of case studies there of the sort of projects we've been involved in for different charities. I think that was about all we wanted to say on the main session, but if anybody's interested, we can stay online for the next 15 minutes or so. We can talk a little bit more about operational research and pro bono OR, or you can just ask questions. You can start uh, unmuting yourselves and have a discussion, whatever you fancy. And I thank you from me for everybody joining this afternoon. Right, thank you very much indeed, Ian. And Amy will circulate the slides. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Goodbye. coming. Hope you found it useful and hope to see you at another one. Goodbye. Thanks, David. Thanks. No. Oh, he's gone. I think no, he's gone. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ian, for being camera on throughout. Yes. Thanks, Ian. You were fantastic. Yep. We've got uh, a hard act to follow with future ones. Right. Cool. All the best, folks. Thank you. Graham, hi. Could I just ask a question about the kind of time involvement and time scales of the pro bono projects? Uh, yes, of course. Um, we, we normally will provide a volunteer for the equivalent of five days full-time work because as most of our volunteers are working, that's about the amount of time that they can manage. Yep. So it was probably the equivalent of five days over two, three months. But Fine. you, you might well get a, a volunteer who's retired or part retired, in which case they could give more time. Fine, I understand I do uh, an equivalent um, pro bono work myself or mm -hmm. um, not on OR but um, on more general management consulting yes. um, so I understand um, the um, I happen to be a relatively new trustee of a rapidly growing charity um, in the south Mm -hmm. uh, that looks after adults with um, uh, learning difficulties, yes. mm -hmm. either through day centres or some residential, or helping them to get into employment, uh, and um, actually employing some of them. 
um, in some social enterprises we run. Mm -hmm. um, do you have um, people with, as it were, social care backgrounds who can understand some of the uh, problems um, of measuring data or collecting data and um, turning it into useful information? Well, we, we certainly have some of our volunteers actually are analysts in the Department of Health and Social Care, so they ought to know something about social care. They should. And we have done, we have done other projects in health and social care. Right, I'll look on the website. As well. So, you know, I, I did some work with, uh, I think it was a social enterprise, uh, wanting to put together a performance measurement and impact measurement system in the area of social care. So uh, we've, got, we've certainly got analysts in government departments with that experience, and we've probably got analysts who aren't in that department, but also have experience working in the sector. Right. Uh, you don't have to convince me that OR might be very useful to us. Um, I need to uh, convince my fellow trustees. Well, pick something small and doable yep. and get a foot in the door. And, and certainly go armed with uh, some case studies, some of our case studies showing what, what we can do, what we've done. Yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Right. Thank um, you. And thanks for joining us, Ian. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Um, and a great presentation. Um,